Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Community Relations Corner, uh, where we discuss issues of concern to New York's uh, Jewish community, to our friends and partners all over the city and the metropolitan area. I'm your host, Michael Miller, Executive Vice President and CEO of the JCRC of the Jewish Community Relations Council. And the first thing that I want to do is to wish everybody a happy Hanukkah. And on each episode of the Community Relations Corner, we're joined by guests representing the political, religious, economic, and diverse community leadership in New York, many of whom I've had the honor of knowing during my tenure here at JCRC. Uh, together, we're gonna discuss uh, issues, current event issues, impacting New York's Jewish community and its neighbors, as well as the state of our city, the state of our state, the state of our nation, and sometimes we even talk about the state of the world. Uh, but first, a message from our sponsor, the sponsor is the Free Synagogue of Flushing, serving the Reformed Jewish community in Queens, New York for over a century. Visit freesynagogueflushing.org for information about their Shabbat and holiday services, weekly Sunday school, and the beautiful spaces available for public rental. Once again, visit freesynagogueflushing.org. Thank them for their sponsorship, and we're excited to have on this episode a great friend, the public advocate of the city of New York, the Honorable Jumani Williams. Welcome, Mr. Public Advocate. Thank you so much. Uh, peace and blessings. Uh, shalom Aleichem, Chag Sameach to everyone. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they're better than I did. I only wish them a happy Hanukkah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so we're, we have a limited amount of time. Un unfortunately, the public advocate uh, uh, has is recovering from having uh, been ill and we don't wanna over, over tax, overburden him. Um, so let's just get right to the most important issue. What does the public advocate do? We know what the title is, but uh, what is the job? What's the role? How do you define the role? That's an awesome question. Thank you for asking. Uh, most folks probably don't know, so they shouldn't feel bad. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's been about, uh, there's been exactly five uh, public advocates. I'm um, the fifth one. Uh, the one before was uh, Tish James, now the Attorney General, uh, then uh, now the Mayor Bill de Blasio, Betsy Gottbaum, and Mark Green. Uh, the Charter gave it uh, about five powers by Charter. One is legislative. You can introduce legislation into the City Council. You act as an um, ombudsman, a go-between between, between the people and uh, their government. Uh, you're a Charter cop, meaning you're supposed to be making sure that agencies are doing their Charter, charter mandated duties. You have a vote on the pension board and you get to appoint people to uh, commissions like the city planning commission or uh, the CCRB. Uh, and the sixth one I always say is the bully pulpit. Uh, you're able to mm -hmm. lift up and, and bring up issues and communities that may not be having the, their voices heard uh, in, a, in a strong way. And uh, just being a community organizer by training, uh, I, I feel that's a very good tool. Well, that, that kind of leads, thank you. That kind of leads me into the second question is that you have referred to yourself as an activist turned advocate. Uh, what was it in your life that made that switch, A, to become uh, an activist and, and B, to step into the role that, that you're in now? Well, thank you. I, I, I refer to myself as an activist elected official. I'm, I'm very proud of that. Ten, 10 years ago, there, wasn't, there weren't too many people saying that. It's interesting to see uh, the difference 10 years makes. Uh, I was actually told I was actually too much of an activist. <laughs> and I would always say, no, I, I don't. I believe the best elected officials are actually activists in the best sense of the word. Um, uh, I'm a public school baby from preschool and masters in the New York City public school system. Uh, masters in political science, actually urban, urban planning. Um, I did work in nonprofits, tenant organizing, community organizing. I, I always say it was before Barack Obama, so people had no idea what it was. I had to, my mom asked me to please get a real job. <clears throat> and I tried to tell <laughs> actually was a real job. So this has been in my blood for a while. And I always, when I got elected and ran for office, I always said that it was just an extension of the work that I was doing, just changed. That's why for me, I couldn't, couldn't get rid of the activism part. Uh, you, you were in the city council. I was in the city council. Uh, you know, I got elected in 2009, was told that you know, I wouldn't be able to win because we're against an incumbent with six people in the race. Um, and we did, you know, the most high lined everything up and um, I've been trying to cause as much good trouble as possible uh, in the past uh, the past 10 years. Uh, and folks may know I have uh, Tourette's syndrome, uh, ADHD, may see me shake a little bit, uh, but I'm okay. Uh, but all of that has helped, you know, 
help me view things in, in empathetic ways and try to figure out how to break down barriers that often are preventing people from uh, living their best lives. Am I, can you still see me? Yeah, yeah, we can still see you. Okay, I can no longer see you, so it's probably on my end, so I'm just gonna keep going. Okay, yeah, please do. Uh, we see you perfectly. Um, okay. and just interesting, as public advocate, I, I know that uh, Tis James, when she was public advocate, uh, she sat in that uh, very well-known chair, big chair uh, on, on the, 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 the dais, whatever that's called, uh, facing all the, all the members. Uh, do you sit in all the sessions as well up there? I don't sit on all the sessions. I, I do uh, sit on a, a lot less. Um, I think actually public advocate before also didn't sit in it as, as much. Betsy Gopam definitely did. I think she did every one. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of um, different things uh, that you have to prioritize. Uh, so it's actually, you know, it's amazing to even be able to preside over the city council. I uh, have a great partnership with the city council. We just passed the bill. Uh, so it's just an honor. Uh, but just in terms of prioritizing what I'm able to do uh, daily, I can't always get to preside over those, uh, uh, over the, the sessions. Uh, but the majority leader, uh, Laurie Cumbo, does an excellent job. <laughs> yeah, and is she in the, the seat that you previously occupied? Uh, no, uh, the, the council member who represents that area now is uh, council member Farrell Lewis. Uh -huh. uh, majority leader Laurie Cumbo is a little further uh, south, uh, but as a majority leader, she gets to preside over uh, the council uh, when I'm not there. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about public policy. One of the most important issues, I believe, which is on your agenda, is, is mental health. Um, you've been very public about mental health, mental health issues that you've confronted. What role do you view government playing in the public policy posture in addressing mental health? Well, I think it's important that we all have a discussion that breaks down the stigmas attached to mental health. I always feel like there's two different pieces there. There's mental illness, mental health. We have to break down the barriers of all of those. Uh, people who have mental illnesses, by the way, the vast majority of people with mental illness are nonviolent. For some reason, we seem to think that they are. And we have to make sure they have the continuum of care that's needed at any given time. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest of us, I always feel like we should all have a mental health check-in. <laughs> Just like we go to the doctor, we go to the dentist. We need to check in from time to time. Uh, and when I learned that, um, I wanted to express that. And, I, you know, for me, I don't know if I would be where I am now in my personal life in particular if I hadn't sought therapy four or five years ago. And that was mm -hmm. critically important to me. And I want to make sure we talk about that with no shame, particularly in communities uh, that don't allow this conversation without stigma attached to it. Yeah, I think that, that's a, a, exceptionally important. Um, I, I know as, uh, as a rabbi and as a, a, cha a chaplain, I was in the U.S. Army. I, I played roles as chaplain here in, in New York as well on many occasions uh, with Red Cross, with uh, law enforcement. Uh, care for the caretaker is extremely important. So those who are uh, really tasked with looking towards the interests of, of, of the people of New York, they need to look after their own interests too. And I, I assume that you agree with me on that. 1,000%. And even when we talk about our law enforcement and, and our police officers, they have among the highest rates of suicide. And that's not talked about a lot. Even right. here in the city, we, we lose a lot of officers by suicide. And I can't imagine what they, what's going through, what they go through on a regular basis, the scenes that they come up with, the cases they have to deal with. And we want to make sure that people have the access without the stigma. And there are some communities that simply are, are dealing with the stigma as well as once we can get past that, don't even have access to the care that's needed. Right, um, so switching to another subject, which is on everybody's mind, uh, today was the, the first day here in New York that someone received a, one of the Pfizer uh, COVID vaccines. Um, the pandemic has impacted on uh, much in New York and uh, cities across uh, the, the country, uh, most especially here in New York on affordable housing, a homelessness and on our houses of worship. So I wanna just touch on, on all three of them again with the limited time that we have of what you have been advocating for, uh, for those who are not in a position to advocate for themselves, uh, the, the homeless population in New York, those of us who work in the city uh, or live in the city uh, see on a day-to-day -day, uh, uh, basis, uh, who no doubt are going to be more directly impacted, let alone minority populations uh, by, by the pandemic. 
Uh, and of course, it spills over your homeless because there isn't affordable housing. So there's a connectivity uh, between all of these issues. We have seen an exact, it has been, a, it, everything that we are concerned about has been exacerbated during this pandemic from affordable housing uh, to food insecurity to gun right. violence. Uh, and we just have to be honest about that. Um, and if we had dealt with some of these issues before, it may not have been as bad. Um, you know, I just want to just interrupt you. And there's one issue that I just want to put on the table as well, which you didn't didn't mention, but I'm sure you know about very well, and, and that's uh, healthcare disparities. Um, that to me is something which our organization is dealing with, building an interfaith coalition around healthcare disparities, which is exacerbated uh, during this pandemic. 100%. And all of those things have been made worse. Things that many of us and you included have been working on even before the pandemic. And we just seem, you know, going in the wrong direction. Affordable housing and homelessness has to be spoken about together. Sadly, in this city, we've had a homelessness uh, chair and a housing chair, uh, uh, commissioner and commissioner, even two different deputy mayors, two different plans. It's all one thing. The vast majority, uh, the, the, the vast majority of the need for the homeless population is housing that they can afford, as well as a subset of that of, of uh, supportive housing. Um, I have seen there not be enough action uh, when it comes to the decisions that need to be made uh, on, a, on, on a fairly bold level when it comes to the pandemic. And it seems like we're just allowing time uh, for viral spread. And I need people to understand when you have a mayor and a governor that can't seem to get eye and eye, uh, when you have them not being able to make decisions quickly, that that does not allow the message to go through. So you have people who feel, well, like if everything's open, I can have family over. Uh, maybe I don't need to wear this mask. And so we need to have a message that everyone understands and is clear. And of course, if you're telling people to stay home and you don't have a home, that doesn't make any sense either. So you have to have a different plan, particularly for people who are street homeless. We will be releasing tomorrow our uh, annual list of the worst landlords in the city, um, to no surprise. New York City itself is probably going to be number one again when it comes to NYCHA. Um, so we really have to crank down on this. And it's really the answers that we've been saying before, but we don't have the proper leadership to push forward. And when it comes to the houses of worship, uh, I do, again, I don't think they did a good job in certain areas in terms of uh, messaging. Uh, at the same time, everybody has to be responsible and the leadership has to step up. It was strange, uh, and I understand why the Supreme Court knocked it down, that you would have something that says, if you have space for a thousand people and a space for 50 people, you can only have 10 people. That, that didn't seem to make any sense. So um, I'm hoping they're tweaking how we're moving forward, but we all have responsibility here and it has to be accountability attached to it. Um, uh, thank you for the very comprehensive answer. Um, and you were a, a uh, we both have, have beards, mine you could barely see, but yours we can see. <laughs> uh, uh, and you came a, a whisker uh, from, from being the Lieutenant Governor of the, of the state of New York. Um, and I, I assume that these issues would have been very, very high on your agenda uh, had you been successful in, in attaining that post. Absolutely. I, I felt like on the state level, there isn't that voice. And I actually, before I, ran public, before I ran for public advocate, I had said, I would like to use a lieutenant governor's position as a public advocate for the state of New York. There has to be someone who is, uh, has the ability to speak up, uh, even in powerful situations. This is just me speaking. I feel like the executives on the city, state, and federal level have not guided us properly. I think we don't, if, if one of them were different, what we're dealing with in New York City and New York State would be different as well. Um, and I do feel like we're still missing that on a statewide level, but I'm just honored uh, that the people of the city of New York uh, have given me the opportunity to be that, to, to be that voice. And we're honored to have you there and, and also on this, on this show. Um, you were a city council member, we mentioned it before, and in your district in East Flatbush, you included not only members of the black community, but members of the Jewish community as well. Uh, so what did you learn about the Jewish community during that time frame that you weren't aware of before, if you can remember? Um, and uh, what do you think that we in the Jewish community need to learn and understand about black communities with whom we share neighborhoods and there, there's been um, a, a tearing apart, unfortunately, back from the, the civil rights era uh, of relations between the, the black and Jewish community. What, what might we need to do in order to repair that, that uh, tear, that rip, um, and, and build more community in New York that is representative of multiples of faiths and multiples of races? 
Yeah, you know, first, I, and, and, and as you know, neither the black community or the Jewish community is a monolith. Uh, so I was gonna make sure that I they pointed out this differences are among everybody. Uh, thankfully, I, you know, I went to Brooklyn College, I had a, a CUNY, uh, a very proud of my CUNY degree, both undergrad and master's. Uh, and so that was the time that I actually was able to interact with a lot of different communities, including the Jewish community. There's a lot of learning there. Uh, uh, Linda Ashkenazi, who ran the Hello yes, Hub. The hello, yeah. Uh, even though we didn't uh, always see eye to eye, we had great conversations, so much so that she introduced me to somebody who was a district leader who was running for council. His name was Lou Fiddler. Uh, may, he, <laughs> so, may rest in peace, yeah. People may be surprised that my four way into politics was actually through Lou Fiddler and the Thomas Jefferson Club. Uh, people are generally surprised uh, to hear that. So uh, it was just great to have that opportunity uh, to, you know, be uh, understanding of the culture even before uh, I became a uh, city council member. Uh, and so I'm always always happy to be with my mom uh, my mom uh, uh, whenever <laughs> whenever we can. Uh, but I would say this is what I found generally speaking, <laughs> that every community I've ever represented primarily wanted uh, the same thing. <laughs> that was uh, they wanted a safe place to, uh, have their family. <laughs> they wanted to have some good and nutritious food on the table. Um, they wanted their children to do better than they did and go to good schools. And there were barriers that prevented that from happening in different spaces or things that can help that happen more. And my job was to try to figure out, well, what are the barriers in this neighborhood? <laughs> what are the things that this community needs? And I feel like we did that in a very good way, very proud of the work that we did there. Most of <laughs> Most of the tension that came uh, from the community was usually more on the political side because uh, it was a little more conservative. They, were, um, you know, they they voted, you know, more uh, uh, in the, the Republican uh, side in, in Trump era. So we had uh, we didn't see eye to eye politically, but when it came to making sure that the services were there and that the resources were there, and that I was working with the organizations that provide direct services, uh, I, I held that above everything. And I still do. And I think as an elected official, our jobs are to find out what are the barriers to living, how long people live their best lives, because that's the bridge. That's, that's what we all want. And I think we can help each other, uh, figure that out and understand, you know, everybody kind of wants that. And, and once we get to that point of view, I think it's helpful. Well, speaking about, thank you. And th speaking about uh, what people want, what, what people need, uh, the, the Jewish community as influential as many members of the Jewish community uh, are in New York is still highly vulnerable. When there was a spike in anti-Semitism just a year ago, uh, we just uh, marked the anniversary of, of the horrible shooting uh, in, uh, in Jersey City and uh, during Hanukkah, the, the slashing uh, in, in Muncie, New York uh, that brought the death of, of several individuals, the murder of several individuals. Um, so uh, law enforcement is very important to us in, in the Jewish community. Uh, on the other hand, we're also very sensitive uh, to the concerns of minority populations, particularly uh, the black community. Uh, and so th this uh, slogan of, of defund the police means different things to different people. What does it mean to you? I think that's important. And it's important to mention that anti-Semitism is very real. Racism is very real. Hate is very real. And it, hate doesn't happen neatly. So normally when you find someone hating on one community, Jenny blue bleeds all over. And so uh, I've tried my best to stand up whenever someone is hurting, uh, whether it's anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, homophobia, transphobia. And I hope uh, that we've realized that we all have to stand up for each other because if we wait for it to just happen to us, um, it might be too late at that point. Um, defund the police is, is a very important conversation needs to happen. Sadly, some people either um, kind of use it to their advantage to confuse people or some people run away from it. And we need to run toward it and have the discussion. It is really important to understand what it means. I believe that everyone can agree that uh, police can't resolve or be responsive to every issue. I think most folks would agree that mental health is a great place where we don't need to have police officers as the first responders uh, to someone in mental health crisis. We very often equate public safety with police when the fact of the matter is police and law enforcement are a part 
of the partnership that we need to create public safety. So where is the rest of the partnership and how do we get it? And so people will say, you know what, well, most folks, they, when we ask them, they want more police. And I'll say, yeah, well, because we've equated it. But also, if you ask them if they wanted additional affordable housing, uh, additional spaces where they can get quality health care, food, and access to jobs, they would say, yes, you just didn't ask that question. And so the question is, how do we get all of those other things that we know when communities have access to them, public safety looks a lot better? And how do we fund those things? And so what we've seen is that most spaces, not just in New York City, have a very huge and large police budget. And then even in New York City, police weren't defunded, but almost every other agencies were. So we lost summer youth jobs. Uh, we lost uh, uh, funding in the Department of Health, every place else. And so it's about right-sizing what we actually need while allowing law enforcement to be able to play their role, but giving the resources to other folks who have been starved for far too long. Uh, you know, we, you know, it's important to realize that law enforcement has a role to play. It just can't be the only role and it can't be the only people that are funded because we know that cutting all the summer youth jobs in half are gonna have effect on public safety as well. Uh, thank you very much for that comprehensive answer. Um, but one of the issues I think that uh, police are dealing with across the country are what we call here in New York EDPs, emotionally disturbed persons. Um, what role is appropriate for police to play and what role is it appropriate for mental health professionals to play? That's a great, a great question. And as I said at the beginning, most people who have a mental illness or who are in mental health crisis are not violent. You know, we're just coming off what appears to be uh, sadly someone who uh, was engaged in suicide by a cop. And it was a sad situation yesterday. Yes, yeah, terrible. I believe it's hard to argue that in a violent situation where there's something like that, that might be where, and first of all, you had no idea that this person may have been uh, an acute crisis and trying to commit suicide. That is the appropriate time for uh, uh, people who are armed to, to probably have a, uh, be the, the lead there. Most cases, the vast, vast majority of uh, cases, general, first of all, in general, most, and most, most uh, things that police officers respond to are not violent at all. Uh, but that's especially the case, right, in people who are mental health and acute crisis. And so they don't need to be the first responders. What we found is that police responding to a situation like that always heightens it because of the, their arm, because of the clothing, it heightens the situation. And so people who have training and experience in de-escalating someone uh, who actually needs mental health assistance and providing that health response, that's what we need. Uh, and of course, if anybody needs assistance, you know, the police officers are there, but we've, we've provided a criminal response for people who need a health response. And so we actually have a bill in the city council now that would, put, instead of someone calling 911, but they would call a 988 number uh, mm -hmm. so that someone can get the health services that they need mm -hmm. as a criminal response that we provide. Oh, quite interesting, thank you. Um, question about uh, the upcoming election, uh, the mayoral election, you're running for, for re-election as public advocate, but there are uh, a, a baker's dozen who are, are running for, uh, for mayor. I think um, baker's dozen at this point. <laughs> Um, so, uh, what, do you, what, do, what are your hopes, uh, what are your expectations uh, of the mayoral role uh, in the city of New York, uh, especially, God willing, will be coming out of, out of this pandemic? What are you looking for within the framework of the leadership that the next mayor of the city of New York, uh, she or he, is go are going to play? Uh, I think, it, you know, it's not shocking anyone. I think a lot of folks have this opinion. I mean, I've been particularly disappointed in this administration and, and the responses and non-responses that have occurred. Uh, so uh, we're hoping we go, we move in it, obviously a different direction. But you know, what I think we need is someone that has uh, the ability to have a bold vision, but actually the courage to make bold decisions. And that's not always easy to find, particularly if there are political consequences. And we have to have someone who's demonstrated that they can be a good manager and a good steward of the city. Um, and that's what I'm looking for. I don't know that I've identified who the best combination of those three things are. 
And so we still have to uh, keep looking. Uh, I'm, I'm, my hope is that more of these candidates would be speaking out about what they think needs to happen during the pandemic. And I think it's been too quiet on that front. I mean, it's, it's one thing to knock the mayor, but it's another thing to say what should be, be done. What should we be doing now? Because it's not easy. Uh, uh, we have to have that kind of courage moving forward to co completely get out of this, uh, what we're gonna be in for a couple of years, at least economically. Yeah, I think the, the economic implications uh, carry forward. Um, last question for you, again, again, within the limits of our time together, uh, it's a political question and the, the Democratic Socialists of America, DSA, put out a questionnaire for those who sought their endorsement for city council. And there are two foreign policy questions, both regarding Israel. One essentially says, don't travel to Israel, particularly don't travel on, on trips such as the trips that JCRC sponsors. Uh, and I just want to mention to our, our, our audience that um, the public advocate uh, doesn't fly, doesn't go on, on airplanes. And uh, regrettably, we haven't had an opportunity or the honor of traveling with him to Israel. But the, the second question is whether uh, they support the boycott, divestment and sanctions against Israel, that movement against Israel. And if they don't, uh, why not? Uh, what are, a lot of people have asked me, uh, about various politicians in New York as to what their positions are. And I've given them answers and you and I haven't had this conversation. So let's do it publicly. Um, oh, what are your thoughts uh, on this and the uh, propriety of, of, of what uh, the DSA is doing? Well, you know, BDS uh, came up in the city council when I was there. Uh, it, it actually shouldn't have because uh, the policy at that moment in time was that the council would not vote on foreign policy uh, because it would just be too many resolutions and they weren't binding, but they did. I ended up uh, abstaining uh, on that. Um, and for me, really, it's, it's hard to say that, you know, I you know, support BDS. But on the other side of that is I'm a very big proponent of king in nonviolence. And it's hard for me to say that uh, someone should not use the tool of nonviolence uh, when trying to uh, affect uh, change. And so it, when there's with things that come up with laws that saying we should ban it or something, it's, it's difficult for me to do that uh, because of my belief in the nonviolent protest. Uh, when it comes to DSA in particular, I wish that the question would have been uh, reframed, reframed to affirm. And so I do believe there are issues around, very real issues, uh, when it comes to uh, Israeli policy and uh, the plight of the Palestinian people. And I feel like there could have been a question that uplifted uh, what was happening in Palestine uh, so that we can reframe the question uh, to be a little bit more constructive than the way it was designed there. All right, well, that, that certainly is an opening for you and I to have um, additional conversations, but I do appreciate as always uh, your forthrightness, uh, your direct responses to all the questions that I posed in this conversation and every other time that we've uh, had a talk. In fact, you and I talked about that BDS resolution um, in, in the city council and you had reached out uh, and spoken with me about it, uh, which I'm very, very grateful for. And even if you and I might have nuances of differences on these issues, uh, it's very important for us to have uh, discussions uh, about them, uh, whether they're privately um, or as we're doing now, whether they're publicly and we hope the conversation uh, continues. Um, speaking about continuing conversations, I want to continue my thanks for our sponsor. And while I'm doing that, uh, I'm just going to ask you, Mr. Public Advocate, to think about uh, your last word, uh, your message to us, particularly uh, dur during Hanukkah, should you wish to relate to that. And uh, now my thanks to our sponsor, the Free Synagogue of Flushing, uh, serving the Reformed Jewish community in Queens for over a century. V visit freesynagogueflushing.org to learn about a wide array of programming and the beautiful sanctuary, social hall, and meditation garden available for rent. And I do hope, Mr. Public Advocate, that you'll have an opportunity to go to the Free Synagogue uh, of Flushing and to see their, their magnificent sanctuary. Uh, visit freesynagogueflushing.org to learn about their Shabbat and holiday services and weekly Sunday school. Once again, Free Synagogue Flushing. Dot org and our thanks to their president, Ed Schauder, who's a member of the JCRC Board of Directors, their executive director and cantor, Alan Brava, and their rabbi, Jeffrey Gale. And my thanks as well to my shout out to our production team, the, the three JCRCGs, Noam Gilboard, 
uh, our chief executive officer, Rebecca Grossman and Jennifer Glick. And now I am going to, and also I just want to thank Noam for th this new uh, virtual background that I have in front of behind me. Uh, normally it's my bookcase and I can pull out a book. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to pull out the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, but uh, it, it, I think it's really cool. And uh, thanks very, very much, Noam. Um, and now uh, for the, the, the last word of this episode and wishing him very, very well as he recovers from whatever struck him, um, <laughs> let me turn it over to public advocate Jamani Williams. Thank you so much again. And I, I'd love to come back and you know continue the conversation. As you mentioned, it is very important. Dialogue is very important. And uh, you know, of course, just you know, back to that last question, a very big support of uh, the uh, two-state solution and making sure folks can uh, you know defend themselves. Um, obviously that's a lot harder than it sounds, or else it probably would have been done already. <laughs> so uh, we definitely have to have uh, those conversations. I would love to visit uh, the Flushing Synagogue, and so hopefully. Uh, and, you know, in the next year I can do that. It sounds like they're doing uh, some amazing work. Uh, I'm a person of faith myself. Uh, my faith actually guides all the work that I do. Uh, so that's important. And, and I, I really have such a huge respect uh, for communities of faith because of that. So uh, during this holiday season, just wishing everyone a Chag Hanukkah Sameach. And hopefully as uh, we move into this new year, we can at least put some of this 2020 stuff behind us uh, <laughs> and start uh, moving forward. Uh, with a little bit more unity. I think, I think that's time. It's time for that. And I want to be a part of that. Well, we, we certainly want that unity and we certainly want to have uh, the open relationship that uh, JCRC and the Public Advocates Office have had that you and I have had. And I couldn't be more grateful that you took the time to have this conversation with us on Community Relations Corner. Um, I, I just got a, a quick WhatsApp that I erred in identifying our chief operating officer as opposed to our chief executive officer, which I am. Chief operating officer is Noam uh, Gilboard. Um, obviously, he does graphics too. Um, anyway, uh, thanks so much to Jermani Williams, the public advocate of the city of New York for joining us on Community Relations Corner. Um, I am Michael Miller, the, the CEO of JCRC, and it's my pleasure to thank all of you and wish you a very, very happy Hanukkah. For those who are not of the Jewish faith, a very happy holiday season. Uh, thanks again for joining us on Community Relations Corner. And we look forward to seeing you again next time. Shalom you all. <laughs>